Mark Rafter, and I've worked with um, some of the people here. Um, uh, we used to work at Parallax together and before that um, at the university. The university. <laughs> 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 okay, <Gary's not> here. <laughs> so, I thought there might be stragglers, so I'd start off with um, a discussion of a problem that, that I want to use as um, chairs. So it's Sudoku. I imagine everyone here knows Sudoku, but just to refresh people's memory, um, what we want to do is find the missing numbers here and the constraints are that each block of 3x3 three three, um, has to contain the numbers between 1 and 9 um, with no repetitions and the same is true for columns and rows. So how do you do this? Well there's, there's the block that we're interested in and we're trying to figure out what goes in that blue square and just by a process of elimination we can see that, um, so for instance, we count round the big square there, um, this one, sorry, and we find that these are the only possibilities. And then examining, for instance, one of the rows, we see we've got a 9, so that kills that one, we've got an 8, that kills that one, we've got a 6, and that kills that one, which means that it's the 1 that goes in there. So the question is, uh, uh, how would you write a Sudoku solver? And it's a genuine question to the audience. I imagine some of you have already done that. Um, so just, you know, take 30 seconds. What, what's on offer in terms of solutions that people have used? Or, or how would you go about doing that? I, I wrote almost more or less what you've just done there, where it just right. iterates through the cells in right. a particular order. I can't remember which it was. I think it was column order. Right. And works out what subset is available. Right. Uh, possible options. Right. And which language is that done in? Uh, can't remember now. Okay, a long was, time ago. Yeah, it was a year ago or something. It was Java, probably. Java, C, Python, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's uh, Sudoku is a, a game that's hiding a, a search problem. We're trying to search through a fairly large space, and if you do it. Uh, in an unintelligent way, uh, the runtime's immense, and there's uh, an amusing uh, thing on the internet that you can track down of someone that uh, thought that test driven development would be applicable to solving this problem without knowing anything at all. So that's Sudoku. So, uh, are there any off other offers about how we go about doing this problem? We'll probably do some sort of functional <coughs> programming uh, okay. approach. Right. That's not how I do it. I remember doing a Miranda thing for solving uh, something about like eight queens. Oh, it could have been. I can't remember. Right. <laughs> so a similar sort of problem, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I saw a very elegant solution for this in Prologue not very long ago, right. where the the solution just defined the constraints and left mm -hmm. the actual algorithm for doing the search to the Prologue implementation. Right. And luckily, it did a good job of it and right. solved it quickly. Right. Okay, so um, so there's there's a range of different ways of doing it, a range of different languages. Um, what I want to do today is to look at a concurrent way of, of solving this problem. Um, and so, what's the algorithm? Well, get eight of our people, get each person to stand on a square, so we need a big board, um, and people on the white squares get nine cards, number one to nine. People on grey squares get one card with the appropriate number on it. Then, what do we do? Well, first of all, people only listen to their neighbours. And by neighbours, we mean people in the same 3x3 three three <coughs> block, or people in the same row, or people in the same column. And people drop a card if they hear that card's number has been called out. Okay? And the only other thing they do is when people have only one card in their hand, as indeed some of the people will do at the start of this um, problem, um, they shout it out. And that um, will solve simple Sudoku's. So what's, what's the structure of this thing? 
Um, the interesting thing about that uh, that algorithm, um, my son-in-law is by no means computer literate, apart from the level of word processing. And yet, yesterday morning, sitting in the kitchen, I explained this solution to him, and he completely understood it. Indeed, it was he that suggested that it be phrased in terms of holding a set of cards. So it's, it's clear that this way of presenting the, the problem is relatively natural. So, let's... let's um, move it more into the area of computing. Um, what have we got? Well, we've got 81 of those things that are representing squares, and they're going to need to know their coordinates, and they're going to need to know the set of possibilities. Um, that's the cards that people were holding in their hands. And these um, squares are going to be doing two things. They're going to be listening to incoming information um, and filtering out the stuff that um, doesn't apply to them, um, or stuff that applies to them but doesn't give them new information. So the information that will be incoming to each of these is something that's equivalent to a coordinate row and column and the value that's being shouted out for, mm -hmm. by that particular person on that particular square. So what these, these um, entities have got to do there is they've got to filter out the stuff, update their uh, set of possibilities uh, in accordance with what they hear, and then when they get to the point of only having a single possibility left, they, they've then got to um, announce that, it, um, that information and send it out somewhere. And what we're going to be doing, because here we're in effect, um, well, if we're all in a room, we've got a kind of Ethernet-like uh, ability to all talk at the same time. Right. But here we're going to um, implement that by replicating the messages. So this message has got to go up to somewhere and that somewhere's got to replicate it out to all of the people down there. And obviously there's lots of efficiency concerns and you can say, oh, I want to not replicate it too much, but I'm not interested in that at the moment. Right. So we've done that. Um, you could actually implement that with unit processes and pipes quite adequately. Um, the questions are, would um, your machine resources allow you to create um, enough processes? Nowadays, yes. Um, and the actual wiring together of all those processes and pipes and not getting it wrong um, would uh, probably take you uh, a little while, at least if you're as error prone as I am. So, a little <coughs> bit of a comparison between Unix and Go then. Um, Unix of sequential execution. Unix, it's a complete program. In Go, it's a function call. Concurrent execution in Unix is a complete process, whereas in Go, the equivalent uh, concept is a Go routine. So that's, that we'll see is a parallelly running function call. Um, it's provide, the, these um, facilities are provided by the kernel or the Go runtime. Uh, in Unix's case, running on a bare machine or a virtualized one anyway. And in, um, in Go, the runtime is actually hosted in, in a process running on Windows or Unix or Mac OS. Um, there aren't Go implementations at the moment that are adequate for running on bare metal um, microprocessors, not ones that I'm aware of. The low-level interface, um, the API if you like, um, for Unix, um, in the setting that we've been talking about, anyway, is fork, exec, wait, pipe, and probably read and write. Um, the low-level interface that's equivalent in Go is the creation of Go routines, and the receiving and sending on channels. Um, Unix has the most exquisite high-level language for dealing uh, with concurrent programming. It's the, the version 7 shell and the things that came after it, the variants like bash, etc. And I'm not talking about sitting down and typing into the thing. I'm talking about it as a programming environment. 
when you're doing shell programming, you are doing concurrent programming. And it is the, uh, one of the nicest languages out there for doing that. So that's a bit of scene setting. Um, the rest of the talk is going to be a quick overview um, on Go, where it came from, stuff like that. And then I'm going to look at two, two areas of the language. One of them was one that caused me the most difficulty at first, and that was understanding um, Go interfaces and how you would do things like traditional object-oriented programming, or something approaching that, in Go. Um, so that's the first chunk we'll do. And then the second thing, we'll return to this Sudoku problem, and we'll implement that in Go. Um, so, Go. Uh, it originated at Google. Um, Rob Pike, uh, a very interesting and creative guy. Ken Thompson, I imagine everyone knows. Um, one, the key, one of the key movers in Unix. And Robert Greismeyer, um, was uh, involved in strong talk in the Java Hotspot compiler, so really knows about language implementation. And in a nutshell, um, I haven't got time to go into all the background I'd like to, um, it, is, it was a response to the horror of using C++ on large projects. Um, Google got to the point where they were on the verge of not being able to build their software. Um, even after Pike reworked all of their build system, it was still taking way, way too long to build their software. Um, there are interesting uh, videos on the net that discuss this sort of Pike video. <coughs> so that was the original team. The Google team now includes a whole bunch of very talented people. Um, and some Google infrastructure actually runs on Go, notably bits of YouTube, their download service, and interestingly, App Engine provides a Go environment. Um, and this is the only compiled language environment that's available on <coughs> App Engine. So what is Go? Um, it's compiled, it's statically typed, it's memory safe, garbage collected, well like most languages nowadays. It compiles and builds blindingly fast, and there's a witness in the back corner um, Martin uh, will tell you that's not exaggeration um, and it's got something about it that makes it feel like a dynamic language or uh, yeah the, the, the feel of the language is a bit like that obviously the speed part of it it's a general purpose language in the same sense that C is uh, there's lots of problems you wouldn't want to try and write in C um, but C is um, purported to be a general purpose language, so Go is in the same sense. Although at the beginning, it was talked about as being a systems programming language. And there are various opinions that echo around the internet um, that <coughs> date from the early days of Go. Um, and so if after this talk you're going to do a little bit of um, research on this stuff, be very careful about the date of the information that you're looking at because Go is um, improving and developing very rapidly. Um, so Go has concurrency through Go routines and channels. It's designed for the age of many core machines. But it's not like Erlang. It's not a genuinely distributed system. Could it be in the future? Well, quite possibly if you know the work that um, Rob Pike did on Plan 9. Um, it has abstraction facilities in it and this is interfaces and there's a reflection system as well. It is well set up for building software in terms of gluing together bits and pieces, so software composition. But it's not inheritance based and part of the talk will be looking at that in some detail. There are no generics in the language yet. Um, there, are, there are designs for them, um, but it's not something that the core team is rushing towards, even though you'll see lots of nitwits on the net saying it's a useless language without. 
platforms it's available on, the various Linux, Unix -ish things like FreeBSD, NetBSD, uh, uh, Unix, Linux, MacOS, Windows, that was done as uh, part of the community, the port. It's available on App Engine as well. There are two compilers. I'm using the GC one, which derives from the Plan 9 uh, uh, compiler suite. Uh, Ken Thompson wrote the GC for Go, and Ian Lance Taylor did a second implementation, GCC Go, based on the GCC compiler. Um, and that's been seen by the Go team as a real plus in that it's kept them honest. Um, there is an LLVM and a Pinnacle um, implementation being worked on uh, by someone out in the com uh, community. The architectures it runs on, the 64-bit uh, AMD architectures, obviously Intel make this as well, uh, the 3x6 architecture, which this thing is, and uh, ARM. Uh, at the moment, ARM 32 bits. Will they be doing 64-bit one? I'm sure they will. Um, documentation in Go is brilliant. Um, there is a language spec. Um, in the, um, the website that um, is the centre of uh, the Go universe, you'll find tutorials, videos, <coughs> articles on aspects of the language. Um, documentation quality is uh, exceptional for a new language. Um, the library, very interesting in a lot of respects, it's aimed to be examples of best practice. So if you want to find out how to write good idiomatic Go, there are loads and loads of examples there, covering all sorts of things, networking, um, language support facilities, all kinds of things. It's a large and developing library, and it's browsable. You can actually go and look around this stuff. Um, so a bit of history, somewhere around 2007, and I didn't have the time to check out all these dates. Um, uh, the design discussion started as a result of these problems I mentioned. Uh, the language spec apparently arrived before the compilers did. Two compilers were there from early on. Uh, Go Zero, 2010-ish, <coughs> maybe, um, yeah. Um, there lots of change, the language was not stable, the APIs were not stable, although at that point Google was running crucial infrastructure on it. 2011, Go 1.0 was released, and at this point uh, a pledge was made about stability, stability of the language, stability of the APIs, APIs. and um, the tools that came with the implementation were actually pretty good. Um, Go 1.1 just happened. Um, the tools and the implementation have improved. June we'll see a bug fix, um, and uh, December Go 1.2 is planned. At the moment, the um, the focus of improvement is on improving the implementation and improving the tools. Um, Go. Go 1 has a stability guarantee that's taken very ser seriously. Go 2 is a long way off. Um, and we won't see generics, I'm sure, before Go 2. Community is very active. Very large number of very talented people, sometimes, you know, a bit too active. Um, language development is it's an open process via a mailing list. All code that's checked in. Uh, undergoes a public code review process and it's been open source from day one and if you're aware of the history of Unix and the Unix authors you'll understand why that's been so important. Um, Unix only got out of Bell Labs as a complete fluke and by the skin of its teeth and thank God it did too. Um, so they weren't about to make the same mistake twice I think and, and Plan 9 really suffered from that. Plan 9 never got out of Bell Labs, effectively. So, um, let's go and have a look at this site, golang.org. In actual fact, I'm not plugged into the net, so it's a bit of a fraud. Um, but, as you will see there, see, try again. But what I'm doing is I'm running 
one of the set of tools that comes with the, the uh, language uh, distribution and you, um, you have a little um, video down there that we can't see you have a way of running bits of code there but much more importantly than that you have things like the language specification available to you um, uh, you have the packages that are available to you so, for instance, I don't know, um, what do you want to have a look at? A crypto package. So here's documentation on crypto package. Um, this is the interface to it. And um, there's the function in question. And if you wanted to look at the source, you could do. So that is just one of many tools. And sadly, I won't have time to talk about uh, the tools very much today. I uh, strongly recommend that you go and have a look at golang.org. Um, before we go and implement that Sudoku problem, what I'd like to do is I'd like to relate Go, not, uh, previously I related it to Unix heritage, I want to relate it to C heritage now. Um, and I saw an interesting comment made by um, uh, I think it was Andrew Garan um, the other day, he said, uh, oh, Go's a better C. And you might think that's kind of damned my faint praise, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought that's, that's actually really interesting and really important. Because C was, was very important in the computing industry. It allowed the first portable operating system to be written. And much of what we have in the way of computing today is directly traceable to the Unix heritage and the C language. It transformed um, computing, although that's going back a little bit now. Um, but C lives under a bit of a cloud with certain problems. So this is the second set of questions, right? What are the problems that people here Right, have suffered with C, and what do they see as the root causes in the language? Memory allocation. <laughs> Memory Mem management. Yeah. Memory management, so the fact that you've got to malloc and free mm -hmm. stuff, and of course if you like me, you free it a bit too often. <laughs> right. Um, overruns. Huh? Memory overruns. Memory right. array accesses that blunder off the end. Um, oh, there's one that I didn't put in there. Null terminated strings causes yeah. some fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, any any more offers? Header files. Header files in what sense? Hey. Hey, <laughs> yes. Hey, very it makes, good. It makes it very difficult to build individual units on their own. Right. Uh, so you can't have you can't, for instance, Unix has to clash without building the entire project and spot up with pre-compiled header very, issues. Very 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 important observation that. Um, uh, uh, Pike's view is that ANSI C made a terrible mistake when they recommended the um, hash include, hash if and def approach um, back in, uh, when was it, 80s? No, no. Um, this is on one of the Pike videos. They instrumented a build and they found that the same source file was being included 37 times. Right, so that's quite a lot. Um, more recently, round about the time they were doing uh, the design of Go, uh, they ins instrumented a big build at Google, and they found that one source file was bit. And bear in mind, when it's included, it's lexed, it's analysed in about three different passes, and this file was included 37,000 times. <laughs> so, that is really on money. Uh. But there are a range of things that are problematic in, in C, and I missed out um, old terminated strings, but here, here's a whole bunch of them. Right, let's just take it as read that there are a lot of problems um, that C um, provides us with. Um, we had C some time ago, C++ uh, arose, again a Bell Labs project, um, and it's important to understand what the goals of C++ were. The goals of C++ were to provide first-class, safe, abstract data types. 
user defined data types so that you could define a, a complex data type and it would look when you wrote a program exactly like something that was built into the, the language and to do it safely. The other goal was to remain close to C, which was good for adoption. The approach was to add enabling features to allow you to build these ADTs and remove nothing. And the language has now reached such a crescendo of enabling features that I've long since given up tracking it. What's Go's approach? Goals are support concurrency, support composability of software, and um, remain close to the machine, but to do so safely. The approach is completely the opposite. It's remove the problematic areas, add a few well-chosen features, concurrency, interfaces, um, uh, slices, to name a few, and to use modern language technology. So, for instance, it's um, memory safe, it's statically timed. So, just to round this bit off, what are, what are the aims and non-aims? Um, first class ADTs were a central aim of C++. They are a non-aim for Go. Right? So, you can't write a complex, although complex is a built-in data type in uh, Go, you can't write arithmetic with complex numbers in the same way that you can with integers. So if you want to produce a vector data type, it's going to look different. Concurrency is the central aim of Go and wasn't a central aim of C++. And for good reasons. Struzdrop knew how difficult it would be. Composability, that's a name for both of them, but they do it differently. Close to the machine, yes. Fast build and good tools. The tools aspect is very important to go, and that was a non-aim for C++. So, we'll look at some code now. Um, syntax, I'm really not going to bother with this. Um, there will be bits of syntax that uh, make it difficult to read. What I need you to do is just you know, call out and say, oh, what's that bit up there? And then we'll talk about it, because otherwise we'll have a long, boring discussion of stuff that we could just read about. So I'm going to look at composability, inheritance in C++ and interfaces in Go. And the kind of the first example almost that people do is an expression tree system. And you have various types of nodes like binary operator nodes as an addition node there. You have leaf values like integer leaves and you know you might have unary ones like negations. How do you do this in C++? Um, or, or Java, for that matter. Right. You have a node data type, a sort of generic one, where you don't really know what it is. Um, you have an evaluation, say we want to evaluate these things, have an evaluation function. Um, each of these data types gets equipped with their own specific evaluation function. And in the case of C++, you make that function virtual. And then the language implementation takes care of everything for you. But specifically, how does it take care of things? Right. So this is C++ now. So if we've got an object of some class, and I'm not going to talk about subclasses and embedded data and things like that. I should have probably left that subclass thing off there. Um, so it's an object of some class. Right. It's got some data members, it's got some member functions as well. And um, if we've got some reference to this object via a reference or a pointer, um, what we've in effect got is the address of that data member. And when we call the mem one of those member functions there, um, the member function is to all intents and purposes an ordinary function equipped with an extra argument and we stuff that address into the extra argument. It's hidden by the compiler, etc. Fine. Um, but what about virtual functions? How are they implemented? What the compiler does is it rips off, and I've drawn it here as the first word of the data structure, uh, it rips off typically the first word of the data structure. It then um, 
in that slot puts a pointer to a table of member functions, or pointers to member functions, pardon. And that is the mechanism that allows you to call a virtual function. Because when you call this virtual function here, um, you will track via that V pointer, pick out the appropriate pointer there, and then call the virtual function for the, the, the particular class you've got. So just popping back to this one here. So we might be operating with something that we only know is a node, but node's a base class from which all of these others are derived, but that mechanism there allows us to pick up the actual definition of the eval function for the particular node. Now this is all fairly well understood and I'm sure everyone here knows that. The reason why I'm talking about this is to make it clear what the difference is between C++ and Go. And what, C, what Go does is it displaces this part of the implementation and it pulls it, it's a little bit more complex than that, and it pulls it back to there and it glues it there. And those two things um, become an indivisible unit. So let's see how we do this in Go. Exactly the same example. Again, we'd have some node data type. We'd have an evaluation function. We'd have the other data types as well with their various evaluation function. And the difference is there are no virtual functions in Go. And as a result, you don't have any of those problems with virtual functions, with them being redefined and wrecking your, your program because they've changed in some best base class or a new one has been introduced. You have a different uh, concept, and the uh, concept is uh, that of an interface. And this is how it looks. We start off with the same setup, your data members, and the methods that uh, go with the, uh, sorry, we have a class, we have data members, and the methods that are part of this class um, operate on those data members. If we are operating on an object via a pointer, it's exactly as it is in C++. The difference is, there is a new notion here. There is a notion of an interface type that is visible to the programmer. Right? Those V tables in the C++ setting were not visible to the programmer. What's an interface type? It's it's a collection of function signatures where they all belong to the same class. That means that there's a maximal interface type associated with a, um, a data type, and that's the set of all of the member functions, and there's also a minimal interface type, and that's the set with no member functions in at all. And there is this notion of a class, sorry, not a class, a type, satisfying an interface. If this particular data type um, that we're dealing with has methods that match these signatures, it implements that interface. Okay? In particular, if we had another interface that didn't have that one in, just had two of them in, that class would satisfy the other uh, interface type as well, because it's smaller. Okay. How does this relate to um, the equivalence with virtual functions? Well, if we didn't have a pointer, but we were manipulating this through an interface variable, then we would have in that interface variable a reference or the value of the object and a pointer to here. So now when we call um, one of these functions that are listed in this interface here, we have the data, we have the address of the data member which we pass in, just like with the old C++ this pointer, and we also have the address of the function in question via the interface type. And these interface types are generated dynamically. 
So what's happened there, if you look at it, we have pulled back across this arrow the pointer to the thing that will give us the ability to do dynamic binding of functionality um, to, to a data type. Um, it's actually very, very significant that, because what it means is these data members are not, in a sense, corrupted by sticking in um, extra bits of data there. They're not, well, corrupted to that, but disturbed. The structure of them is not disturbed by it. It lives over there. It makes those more costly, but those cheaper. And in terms of a cost-benefit analysis, it is, it is quite delicate, I think. Uh, oh, so if we if we assign an object like this to an interface value, we know that it can satisfy this. So at that point in time, at runtime, it actually fills this information in. And I'll just leave it at that at the moment. But equipped with that view of it, you would be able to go and read the the stuff on interfaces, and make um, sense of it. So let's have a look at how we do the expression tree example, but now using Go code. Because when we look at the, the code, um, given the background in Java or C++, it should be pretty clear how we do stuff. So here are the types that we introduce. Now this is where you have to start shouting out and saying, I don't understand that bit of syntax. Okay. So type node. Right, that introduces a new type. So it's not like type def in C. This actually introduces a new type named node. And it's naming an interface that contains only one function, signature, which is going to be eval, which returns an integer. Um, and here we've got three types. <coughs> there are um, int node, uh, neg negation node, and addition node. And they contain the obvious things, a value, uh, in the case of an integer node, um, a reference to a node, um, or a left or right node. And I probably meant to have pointers in that. Um, how do we do evaluation? Well, for each of these data types, we've got to supply an evaluation function. And I'll talk you through um, the syntax. So it's a function, and this is a function called eval, which returns an integer. Um, and this is the bit that makes it a method. So the member functions in C++ are called methods in Go. <coughs> so um, here we see that it's a method on a negation node. Here it's a method on uh, the, other, uh, the integer node. And there it's um, on an addition node. Initialization. Um, similar sort of thing, I've made them members, I, I won't dwell on that. And here's how we use it then. So we're creating a new integer node, we're calling the initialization function, and what we're doing is building the tree bottom up. Um, we've got two of those, we feed one of them in there, get a negation node out, and then feed the negation node and the other leaf node in there. And then we can print out and this is the equivalent then of virtual functions. These are, inter, uh, these are all interfaces here. Um, sorry, I didn't edit that one out. This is a last minute change. Right, that should say node there. And, uh, and then this is, in, we're calling through these interface values um, and picking up the appropriate. So what's the construction in your image? Right. This is this is built into the language new, yeah. right? Which returns a pointer, and this dot function name is member call. So that's like it is in C++. So in it is always uh, no, it's not. Uh, I skipped oh, over this. Okay. I'm I'm supplying a load of member functions. New is the language. New new is the thing that gives. Um, okay. uh, uh, a freshly minted object, yeah, and it's zero. Mm -hmm. As in, it's the this initial state is equivalent to doing a mem set zero on the. Um, it's it is, but it's slightly more nuanced than that. Okay. Um, 
So if we want, so, so that does what we wanted there. So the basic message here is that you have an interface. If in your data type you implement the method, um, you satisfy that interface. And so if we want to do formatted I.O., and instead of writing this stuff here, right, we would just like to be able to say, print out um, the expression. We can use the stringer interface in the formatted I.O. package, which, which means that to satisfy that interface, all we have to do is provide um, a method of the same name, string, that produces a string. And so we're telling for each of these node types um, how to implement the string, uh, how to satisfy uh, the stringer um, interface. And you get formatted I.O. for free at that point. So, summary, and I know this is very high speed tour. Summary, um, the syntax um, is interface in Go, derivation in C++. In Go, um, the, the declaration is implicit. You, you never declare something to be derived. It's explicit in C++. And in Go, the relationship is is like as opposed to is which is more the C++ module, uh, C++ approach. And the coupling is loose here, and much stronger in C++. Uh, so, so even if I've got a library from somebody, I could actually inject new methods into it? Um, no. What you can do, though, is you can, um, you can define a type based on that, and for your new type, you can add those methods. So you're in, in some sense wrapping um, the existing type. And then you can add new methods to that. So in particular, um, the built-in types, things like integer and floating points, can have methods applied to them. Um, I think I couldn't quickly cast more light on it than that. But I'm quite happy to come back and do a follow-up talk sometime. I can see that time might be in danger of um, defining a, a functional method for my new type mm -hmm. that had the same name as something in some library I was somehow importing, and whereby I would inadvertently be implementing no. that interface. Do I get a warning about that? Um, You, th there are ways around that problem, right? But um, uh, but I couldn't explain them at the moment. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, what I'd like to do is, is pass on to try and touch on some of the concurrency stuff. I'm sorry, Julia. No, I no. Got so how do we do this concurrent Sudoku? Um, the advantage of going through that previous example is. Um, sort of, you're vaguely familiar with the syntax of Go now. So, this is the thing that we had before. We, we've got these squares. Um, they've got to look after rows, columns, and possibil uh, the possibilities. Um, each of them is going to receive information, messages in actual facts, and this is the type we'll use. Um, uh, so it's the, the coordinates and the value that's being announced. Um, over there we're going to have a type cell to deal with all that stuff. And all of these little um, lozenges uh, will be channels, one for each of the, the squares. And they'll be called announcement. Um, the things have got to filter, but they've also got to send on results. So we need a channel to send it on, and we'll call that solution. So these are all typed channels. Right? In Go, the channels are typed, and you can pass anything across a channel you want. A function, another channel, 
um, a structure, an array. Um, those messages then need to go back up to the top. Um, we'll have a type there to look after that called game. And we'll have a channel there that we read from. And that's got to replicate the stuff. So that's exactly what we were talking about in the Unix setting. Uh, but now it's with Go Routines and Channels. And using these types that we've introduced and those channels, um, we'll see what the code looks like. So um, this is fairly straightforward. The structs are pretty much like C structures. The first one, the result, is just those three integers we need. The game object is going to have a two-dimensional array of cells. They're the actual cells of our Sudoku problem. And it's going to have in it um, the channel that we were talking about. <laughs> That's that result. It's part of the game. Um, I take it channels are uh, made to, uh, provided by the API? Uh, they're part, no, they're provided by the language itself. Okay. Right, so go routine is a primitive, channel is a primitive. Okay. So it's a type constructor in, the, in a sense, in the same sense that it's struct or array is. Um, so this type cell, so each of these little cells need to know where they are, what their possible values are, and they've got to have two channels here. Right? One for receiving information on, and one for sending information out. So that's the types that we're dealing with. Initialization, which I won't dwell on too much, but uh, how do we make these channels, um, is done here. So this is data initialization, just passing an array in and then uh, sending on for each uh, cell. Not interesting. We make a channel here. g.result equals make channel. So we're making a fresh channel. And then for each of the cells, this is just a function I've written, um, we make a channel and assign it to the announcements channel. And for each cell, we um, assign to the solution channel g.result, and that should be covered in here. And then for each of the cells, um, we want to run a solver function. So at that point, let me just go back here, we would have created all of those and initialized them. In each of these, we will have a way of reading from a channel and writing to a channel. Right? And up here, we have declared a channel in there that we will read from. So that's wiring up all that stuff the equivalent to the wiring up of all the forks, execs, and pipes that we'd have to do in a Unix setting. And you can see it's relatively straightforward. Although, obviously, you know, it's kind of a bit of a, a lot of information to digest. But I think it's a feel the width exercise, really. You can see that it's relatively straightforward code um, uh, with no obvious trickery going on. So how does the solver work? Well, what does the solver have to do? It's got to receive a result, and then it's got to broadcast it out. And so we have a select statement in here. These are the receive operations. This is um, a, a receive operation. This is a send operation. So this is how we're doing our multiplexing. We're just continually going round. We're receiving a message off of the results channel. That's the blue one coming up there. Been sent out by some cell, we don't know who. And then we're just broadcasting it out to each of the cells via the cell's announcement channel. So it goes, we pick it up, and then we replicate it out. And this is the for loop wrapped up in the a utility function over it. Okay, so it's cascaded out to all of those cells at that point. And we've got a little timeout in here. Right. Um, because the way this works is it's a machine that just goes round and round and round. And like with the people in the cards, eventually 
because you've only got a finite number of cards, people have got to stop shouting out, haven't they? You can only, you know, you've only got nine cards. There's only a finite number of people. So eventually, we'll get no more messages in here. And at that point, we time out. And if it's a simple problem, we're done. Is it similar or analogical to airlines? Uh, it, it, it's similar, yes. It's not the same. Um, uh, and in particular, these are not, by default, buffered. Very important thing okay. it, that you can create buffered channels, but the default is unbuffered communication, and that is the way in which synchronization is done between processes. So the cell solver is the same, and I, I wanted to change these round, but I had such a lot of pain with Impress that I didn't dare change it. So let's imagine that this is the first part of this loop, okay? So what do you do? Um, you, you're in a cell, so you're listening, right? So you listen on the announcement channel, right? Um, and uh, I, I'll skip over this, but it's not important. Right? And uh, if the message that you've received is one of your neighbours, and that's a utility function, you know, it's some calculations with I's and J's, right? Then um, you update your the set of possible values. So you've heard a number called out by your neighbour, and you drop that card on the floor. So the other, that's what you do first of all, right? And then afterwards, right? What you have to do is you have to see whether you, you've dropped eight cards on the floor. So this is just going around there, having a look to see whether you've only got eight cards and making sure you only shout out once. So if you, you do that, you send the result, your row, your coordinates and the value um, that's left in, in your set of bits um, to the, the channel um, of the multiplexer. And that's it. So, Again, it's a field of width exercise. Right. There isn't anything terribly complicated going on in here. Right. It's relatively straightforward, but what we've done is we've created a network of 82 processes in doing this. We've wired them all together. Um, we've built a multiplexing... Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, a, a distribution system for these messages uh, and we, we built using this we, we've produced a solution a concurrent solution to Sudoku obviously you would need to look at this stuff and you know read it carefully um, and there's one little piece of uh, where's it going? There's one little delicate thing here. Because these communications are non-blocking, you need to make sure right, that you do this send here in another go routine. Right? And this is the primitive that allows you to create a go routine. You just say go and then a function call. So that's all there is to it. In particular, there is no way of referencing a go routine. There is no handle in the language for doing that. And that is a blessing, right? Because all of those complicated schemes people come up with are now impossible. And the way you do synchronization, 99 times out of 100, is with channels. And this channel based way of doing synchronization and passing data is beautiful. Uh, obviously, you can get things wrong, right? and the runtime will um, detect deadlocks, for instance. If everything locks up, it will say, oh, deadlocked. Right. And in the latest release, there is a new tool called Race, which will actually go through your program, instrument it, and check for data races in it. So very sophisticated tools. Anyway, so that's it. The key message is, 
Um, go routines. These are the independent thread of execution um, and channels between uh, that you use to communicate and synchronize between Go routines. So, at the point at which you call Go, yeah. does execution of this, of the current routine, continue? It's a very interesting question. Yes, it does. Or does it No, no, no. It, uh, it's an independent, we hear an independent Go routine, yeah. right? And we say Go, and the only thing that happens is a new um, th independent flow of execution is created. Right. Yeah. And we continue. <coughs> the only so essentially you're, you're scheduling a piece of work that will be carried out at some indeterminate point in the future and uh, you carry on. Potentially straight away. But potentially straight yeah. away. Yeah. The only thing you know is any arguments you pass in have made their way over to the, the invoked Go routine and that it, it and you right, continue um, uh, from that point on. And presumably it has no way of communicating back to you except by another channel that you may exactly. be listening to. Okay. You, 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 you wire it up the way you want. Um, what these decisions have done is they've stripped out huge amounts of complexity. Right? It's, simple, it's very much in the same spirit um, as the Unix I.O. system as it used to exist in the V6, V7 days. Really beautifully lean but uh, an API with which you could, you could build fabulous things. And I believe that's the same thing. So is that, sorry to ask again, but that's at the point at which that Go function is executed, as in defined here, yeah. is the data that goes into it effectively copied at that point? Yes. Yeah, of course. Yes. Yes, it's it's yeah. yeah, well, otherwise bad things yeah. can happen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm used to the bad things happening in other languages. Yeah, <laughs> and the the passing of data is a copying via a channel is a copying operation as well. Yeah. So there's no but shared state. I uh, know that. Uh, I was just about to say, but you can. This language has pointers, but say pointers. pointers in there. So you can pass pointers, mm -hmm. right? But then you get into the the question of how do you manage shared state, and the answer is you use channels to do synchronization. So in effect saying, okay, I'm passing this pointer to this huge object to you, but it is now yours, right? And I will not read or write it. It's up to you to do that. And then when it's finished with it, via another channel, it can send the information back to you, saying the pointer back to you, saying, you now have ownership of this. So there are um, idioms that you can use to have your cake and eat it. Is there any enforcement of that? No. no. So when you call the go, you're, you're being sent a closure, though, aren't you? I mean, if, um, if for some reason you change C that row just a bit further down. Uh, uh, this uh, this one here is a straightforward. Uh, anon uh, sorry. Right, I understand. It's an anonymous function here. It is a closure, yes. Right. right. But it, it could be a named function, right? You could, uh, you know, this might have been printf, for instance. Or the Go equivalent. But it's um, sort of called by name, we would say in Scala. So the, uh, it's I, evaluated I, whenever it's actually the, required. At, at this point, the yeah, the arguments would be evaluated every time the Go construct was executed. It doesn't wait until it actually executes. Yeah. It's at the time of construction. It copies the values. Yes. Yeah. So you have a this this. Um, I'll use the term thread of execution, it's not a thread. Yeah, but this thread of execution going down here, I want to create a go routine now with some arguments. You say go function with arguments, and the runtime creates the go routine here. It then assigns those arguments across to the incoming arguments for this function, and then the two continue in some indeterminate way. Does that make it a bit clearer? Yeah, so to summarise practical actualities, if you, if, if in that funk you passed C and you modify C immediately afterwards, the value of C that's executed is as it was at the point at which the line no, of funk existed. Because, because yeah, C is the pointer. In that case. Uh, well, it, de it depends what you'll see, what the type of C is. If it's an integer, right, you're fine, yeah. right, because it's copy, it's called by value, right. If it was a pointer, 
right? And then inside there you were changing it, it would be bad. Let me just quickly um, go on. So this is the same thing, right? With the two pieces of code on the same uh, sheet. Um, that is the message uh, send in one direction from the cell up to the, the game. And then a thicker one, this is the um, multiplied set of messages coming back to all of those cells down there. And there's the timeout. And why are these things hard to understand? Partly because this is like programming with go to's. Right? Concurrent programming um, is difficult to think about. Inherently difficult to think about because um, the, the, the flows are very complicated. And uh, Pike and Co have just recently been talking about the fact that they are in the process of discovering new idioms for knitting networks of processes, uh, processes together. And Pike's view is there are no experts in Go at the moment. Which is pretty interesting from one of the creators of the language. Right. I interpret that as this being a very, very rich and productive environment. Right. Can you shoot yourself in the foot? I'm sure you can. You can with most systems. So, well, if you go back to the previous one, you are talking about swapping the... Um, working out whether you found a solution and listening to the analysis. Yeah, that, 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 that was just... Uh, the, the, this stuff has been hacked up over but, the past two but days. Wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't your whole system deadlock if you sort them around? Exactly. And, and that's why I ran out of time. What you would have to do, and what my code actually does, is you have to, in the um, game solver one, have a message that you can send to get the cells going in the first place. Right. So that is really perceptive, that is. Right. And what, what I've got in, uh, in this system is I found that having that was very nice because the other thing it allows you to do is you can restart the computation. Right? You can let everyone um, finish and then return or you know, just sit there waiting for the, the next chunk of information and then you can adjust information in the system and then you can <coughs> start up uh, the computation again. Final thing I'll say, all of this is fine right, in theory, but what does it cost? Right. Um, how expensive are these go routines? Um, because uh, I haven't got accurate figures for things like Unix processes, um, POSIX threads, and Java threads, but my impression is they're still pretty expensive. <coughs> right. um, so. What I've got here is a little program I wrote um, called GoSleep. And what you can do <coughs> is you can tell it how many um, Go routine threads to create. And so by default, I think it, it does five. Right? And we can see entering the Go routine and then leaving the Go routine. And it runs PS in the middle and it is properly synchronized. So that tells us what the resident set size of this is. And we can shut it up so that uh, it's a bit more honest uh, um, because we don't know what those printouts are costing us. And so there, it was 120 microseconds to create five Go routines. And these are small Go routines, but there again, the Go routines we had there are. So, how long does it take to do 10 Go routines? Or Oops. A thousand. Or ten thousand. This is a really weedy little laptop that we're running on here. It's got three quarters of a gigabyte of memory. It's got a 1.4 uh, gigahertz Celeron processor. And at least um, a third of the memory is consumed by Ubuntu. Um, so you can see that creation of Go routines um, and synchronization through channels is actually um, a relatively cheap um, process. Well, no, a very cheap process. 
and I've overshot by five minutes. I would take questions, but I'm sure everyone's got work to go to. <laughs> yeah, but it's not very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would, um, I would strongly recommend that people have a look at Go. It is, it is fascinating, and um, there's lots to be talked about in the area of tools, etc., which I haven't been able to touch on today at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.